Welcome. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Stephen Houston of the Department of Anthropology at Brown University. And I'm going to hit him right between the eyes with the first question of, tell us a secret about El Zotz. The secret is that it's even visible to us today because it's covered with dense foliage, jungle, yeah. and it's only really through uh, systematic excavation and survey over the last couple of years that we've been able to find it and see how big it is and how important it is to Maya archaeology. Maya archaeology, where is this thing? This thing is located uh, not too far from the great city of Tikal. So it's in northern Guatemala, mm -hmm. and it's on a long valley that extends west from Tikal. We call it the Buena Vista Valley because it's uh, got a good view. That's good view in Spanish. Zots. So okay. Zots is right there. Uh -huh. In between are cities we've also explored that are much earlier. You've explored. Yes, that I've done. How many cities have you explored, Steve? Good I've God. explored dozens and dozens. and. Uh, <laughs> No. Some uh, bigger than others. There aren't that many big Maya cities. And so what's this, El Zotz? It's not Tikal. What's, what's it mean, Zotz? El Zotz means the bat. And it's named the bat because it has, not too far from it, one of the largest populations of bats in the, probably the New World. There's a big collapsed sinkhole. And from it, every night at about 7 o'clock issue, millions and millions of these things. You got any pictures up. of that? There are some available, <laughs> which we can put do they, online. Do they harvest guano? Uh, no, they don't, although it's uh, quite uh, an unpleasant mass when you walk on it to look I at the bats. I can well imagine. Yeah. But it sounds like other things get har uh, harvested out of zots and sites in this area. To, uh, is there a problem with uh, a little bit of looting? Um, More than a little. There are hundreds and hundreds of looters' tunnels and trenches in this site. It was massively looted in the late 1970s, maybe even into the early 1980s. And from it have come many objects that, from some of the glyphic or hieroglyphic mm -hmm. or textual information we know must have come from El Zoltz, including this okay. pot we're looking at right there, which is in uh, Australia right now. And the text tells us it's a king of El Zoltz. Must have come from one of those tunnels that was uh, hacked out of these pyramids about mm -hmm. 30 years ago. Is that how you knew about the presence of Zotz, that stuff was coming out? Or how, how did you first discover it? Well, I didn't discover it. Right. There's no site that an archaeologist discovers in a way. It's always seen first by a shepherd or uh, by local a, informants. a local yeah, yeah, informant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In this case, um, every other tree, it seems, up in El Zotz has sl basically cut marks on it. And that's because they would go out here to harvest chicle. Chewing gum, essentially. It would, the sap would run during the huh. rainy season. They'd collect it, boil it down. And from that, we get notice or information about many of the Maya ruins. Now, mm -hmm. uh, the city itself, though, was first explored by archaeologists, mm -hmm. partly because they'd heard reports about looting. They went in at about 78 or so, mm -hmm. maybe a few years before, and they began to map it, but in a crude way. Mm -hmm. Ours was the first project from Brown essentially, to go and look at it in detail. Okay. And how long, have you started when and ended when? Are you done with Zotz? Uh, we're now what does in, it mean to be done with an We're never done with yeah, the site right, right, yeah, because yeah. there's the field component to the, right. which is when we go out and dig and survey. Mm -hmm. But then there's a much longer span in which we think about what the results might mean, and eventually mm -hmm. we hopefully write it up in a systematic and responsible way. The Zotz is a Mayan site. Um, Mayans, Guatemala, Mexico, mm -hmm. Put me in space and time. Where are these folks? The Maya are a people that probably first come into existence about 1,000 to 2,000 years before the beginning of the Common Era. Probably they existed before, but uh, we don't have much evidence of them. At okay. that time, they were living in tiny villages. But probably just a few centuries before Christ, mm -hmm. they began to build massive pyramids, large settlements, particularly in this focal area that we call the Peten. It's the northernmost part of Guatemala. Okay. And so from that time until approximately about eight to 900 AD, mm -hmm. they were constructing some of the largest cities of the New World that contained many hundreds of thousands of people mm -hmm. spread across a landscape. They had intensive agriculture, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they were literate. So they mm -hmm. left a, a written record that we can decipher. We have the names of kings. We have the names of members of their court, queens. And we get a kind of historical texture here that's really not available in many other parts of the New World. And do the I work in the old world, yeah. and we have many of these literate, complex societies, and we're always comparing to the Maya, the Greeks and the Maya, the Egyptians and the Maya. Um, so, yeah, 
we're all, uh, and we always look and say, I wish I'd done Mayan archaeology. And do you tend to wish you'd done I Roman archaeology? I would love to work on a Greek site or a Roman site, absolutely. Uh, you're still young. Can, um, explain the geography, I mean, the sort of the political geography. Do these cities get along? Do they fight with each other? Because the Maya collapse, right? That's like the one thing I know about the Maya. They collapse. Well, what, what we have in the Maya case is we seem to have both some kingdoms that were very, very disproportionately powerful. They mm -hmm. exercise control over other kingdoms. Mm -hmm. But we also have the sense that the kingdoms themselves were almost like, in a, by vague analogy, Renaissance city-states. They weren't uh -huh. very large. Uh -huh. They had uh, uh, kings or mm -hmm. people of comparable status. Mm -hmm. They had courts of varying size. And then somehow they controlled the farmers around and probably some of the trade as well. So the distance, generally speaking, from the center of one of these kingdoms to its very edge, which mm -hmm. would have been a, probably a tent zone of some conflict, is no more than about a day or so's walk, maybe Good two, God. three days. So yes. on this chart we see behind us, these huh. maps, you can huh. look at over to the side um, a series of little bubbles of varying color. And mm -hmm. what those are indicating is very approximately the size of these kingdoms over time. And you can see that they pack together. The distance here isn't very large. It's just a couple that's, of... That's a lot like Greek city-states then, too. So Very, very similar. Yeah. And the red oval that you see here is probably more or less the kingdom of El Zot, as it was flourishing, let's say, about five to 600 years after Christ, okay. after the beginning of the Common Era. Mm -hmm. uh, the colors here are showing uplands, uh, which are dark brown, huh. and the light blue areas are swamp. They probably were farming down there, but... There but could not have been very above. many people living in those zones. Oh. And you, so you can see that the kingdoms tended to cluster in these upland zones. Mm -hmm. They wanted to have access to lowland areas, probably for agricultural reasons. But they wanted to get up high also because it was defensive. So the kingdom that most people have heard about is the one colored in blue, and that's Tikal. It's one of the major tourist attractions of big Guatemala. Pyramids, Large pyramids. pyramids. I've and been there with Steve. It's, it's that's right. And, uh, and the, the fascinating thing is that, is that these sites are, to use a bit of jargon, intervisible. So that if you're on the top, the highest pyramids of Tikal, mm -hmm. you can see El Zolts and vice versa. So you could see your enemy. You could look across, let's say, the old Berlin Wall. Or, or your friend the, or your father-in-law. Potentially, or, yeah, yeah, because the they, uh, yeah. to be um, an enemy or, or an enemy dynasty or kingdom in the Maya is often to be dealing with cousins or distant relations I, as well because they're intermarrying at this high level.